me out to the ball game. Take me out with the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and cracker jacks. I don't care Steve if I never... the Society of Iowa, so I work for all of you. And... Uh, take that very seriously. I'm honored to follow in the footsteps of Michael O. Smith, who is another former curator, and pleased to have Michael in the crowd tonight. So thanks for coming out, Michael. Uh, I've been with the state for just over five years. I'm a Des Moines native, I can say that, because I was born at Mercy Hospital, and uh, grew up in Clive. My uh, family had moved to Clive in the 1920s. My dad was there in the 20s. So. People say, oh, nobody's from Clive. I can say that. Uh, my dad grew up there from 25 to 19, about 34, and then moved to Des Moines. So uh, that's, that's my quick background. Iowa State for my undergrad, uh, Eastern Illinois University for a master's degree, and then uh, all but a dissertation toward a PhD in American history from Iowa State. Uh, I've worked at Living History Farms, and that was how I got interested a little bit in, in Central Iowa baseball history. Then. Uh, I worked at a couple other museums, including one in uh, Dearborn, Michigan, where we started a, a historic baseball program. It was already going when I was there, but in 1867, Detroit hosted what they call the World's Tournament of Baseball. And a Canadian team came in. Uh, it actually was advertised in the Burlington paper in 1867 that Detroit was hosting this tournament. And uh, so right after the Civil War, baseball's really taking off. It wasn't because there was uh, at least two teams in Davenport before the Civil War, uh, one of them being an African-American baseball club in Davenport pre-Civil War. So it wasn't like the Civil War introduced Iowans to baseball. Iowans knew about baseball, especially those in larger towns that had been going since the 1830s. So I'm starting to get ahead of myself, though. So uh, Living History Farms, Henry Ford Museum is a curator. Uh, Salisbury House is a curator and educator for about three years. and as I said, with the state for just over five years now. And uh, I think that's my introduction, so you know who I am. Though, growing up in Clive, uh, my family moved back to what had been my dad's boyhood home right before I was born in 1965. And when the Oaks came to town in 1969, a number of them lived in the Ravenwood apartments in, uh, between Franklin and Hickman. And my mom babysat for the children of a number of the players, including Renee Latchman, who was a catcher. His brother Marcel was a pitcher. And Renee had a son, Jim, who was my age. And so I grew up as a six and seven year old, five, six, and seven year old, uh, hanging out with some major leaguers who were playing AAA ball. And that was a, a fun way to grow up. And just for the record, I bat left, throw right, hit number four for the Dowling baseball team of 1983. Uh, ranked number four in the state, losing tragically to Valley in sub-state. We went on to come in second. Uh, that was okay, uh, but uh, that's 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 my quick personal uh, baseball. Played some uh, fast pitch softball in Des Moines. Then after high school, a little bit of slow pitch too. Uh, so got interested in baseball history, starting at Living History Farms in the 1990s. Uh, and then moving to Michigan when I was there in the late 90s and learning that they had this tournament in 1867 in Detroit, we modeled a program after that. And so we have about, I say we, I say we about Living History Farms, even though I don't work there anymore too. Uh, we had teams from Ohio, Indiana, uh, Michigan coming in and playing in that tournament. And so really started paying attention to how baseball got started, then came back to Des Moines and wanted to learn more about Iowa baseball history. And, and if you know John Leopa, there's probably nobody better than John, uh, but I'm okay. So uh, we're going to talk about the Capital City Baseball Club to the I Cubs, a look at the history of baseball in Des Moines. And by no means will this be comprehensive, and I'm sure there's stories out there that you folks know that I don't. But these are some compelling beginning stories and just how baseball fits in American history to start us out. So. Uh, as I said, let's see how my order was doing here. We are turned on. Maybe I can move to this side, get a little better angle on my order. So there. We're now turned on. But it's still not working. There we go. Uh, just a quick timeline of baseball history. So the first mention, and I won't go through all these, but the first mention of baseball in any documented source so far in American history is 1791. Pittsfield, Massachusetts builds a new town hall. 
and they want to keep the windows in good shape. And so they ban playing of different ball games, including baseball. So that's the earliest, and Jim Bouton, if you're a baseball fan, Jim Bouton is a big uh, baseball historian as well as a former major leaguer. And so Jim was the one who, uh, in doing some research, some of his people came across that. But by 1837, uh, these are clubs when they first are founded. It's a gentleman's organization, and it fits within, especially in the Iowa time period of founding, within Victorian uh, ideals and mores. So they're clubs. They've got a constitution and a set of bylaws. So Philadelphia uh, had a set of constitution, had drafted their constitution by 1837. Uh, the first New York games, and those are the common rules of today. They're the antecedents of today's baseball go back to 1845. Then the 1854 rules get adopted uh, as the New York rules, but go back to the 1840s. 1857, the National Association, which is an amateur league, later becomes the National Association of Professional Baseball Players. That's today's National League. So they trace their history really to 1857. Massachusetts rules are published in 1858. That baseball player's pocket companion is the first known dedicated book to baseball rules. Baseball rules show up in other publications before that, but that's the first American publication laying out baseball rules. Uh, and then 1860 is when you get this cheap little dime publication called Beatles Dime Baseball Player that will list the rules. The uh, National Association had a rules committee going back to 1857. So if you're a baseball fan today in major leagues, there's always a rules committee meeting every winter meetings. The hoes go back to that 1857 National Association. So. Uh, the idea of rule changes, they were happening all through the 1850s and the 1860s and continue to, the, you know, to today. So that's a quick pre-Civil War history of baseball. As I said, uh, here's one from the Davenport Daily Gazette from 1859 saying, an impromptu gathering of baseball players took place on the bluff Saturday afternoon and, for, and a few games played with hearty zeal. A meeting of the members of the old baseball club is desired this evening at Jewel's Paint Shop on 3rd Street. That has become the, what has become of the old cricket club? And there was, there was this debate between, are we going to play cricket in the United States like they do in England, or are we going to develop our own game? And baseball starts getting called the national game even before the Civil War. Uh, and so there are certainly enough young men on this side of Pikes Peak to get up both a cricket and baseball club. So here's 1859 saying the old baseball club, knowing that at least pre-1858 in Davenport, you had a baseball club formed. And as I said, I know by 1859 there was at least one other club, and one being an African-American club being formed in Davenport in 1859. So in those larger communities, baseball is already taking off before the Civil War. And it has reached enough popular culture that when President Lin candidate Lincoln is running for the presidency, this is an 1859, 60, spring, fall of 1860 presidential cartoon where you've got uh, John Bell, Stephen Douglas, and uh, John Breckinridge, and Abraham Lincoln as the four presidential candidates and using baseball as a metaphor for the presidential race and Lincoln's talking about hitting a home run in 1860. And he's got his split rail bat, and that you're going to need a bigger bat to beat him. And you need to strike fairly so that baseball has reached popular consciousness enough by 1860 that in political cartoons it's being used to reference the different political candidates. So, uh, and they're calling it the national game, three outs and one run. Three outs being the other men and the one run being president candidate Lincoln uh, at the time, because it is, it's pre-election. Pre, pre and it's also being used in sheet music as a uh, popular uh, motif. And so uh, this is a 1860, uh, I think baseball fever is 1865, 1866, and saying, uh, all round about we've queer complaints which need some doctors patching but something there is on the brain which seems to me more catching. Tis raging too, both far and near, or else I'm a deceiver. I'll tell you what it is now plain, it is the baseball fever. 
And I remember when that slogan was around in the 70s as a baseball fan, it was like, oh, what a great idea. Baseball fever, catch it, uh, was a Major League Baseball uh, slogan. And it's like, oh, that goes back to the 1860s, the idea of baseball fever uh, sweeping the, the country. Uh, I also have Catch It on the Fly up there, another piece of sheet music that was done in the mid-1860s, one of the rule changes that took place. And baseball fits into Victorian America because it's a manly game, it has an organized set of rules, and there are characteristics of what a baseball player should be. And one of the things is to be manly, as I said. And early rules, pre-1867, both a ball caught in fair or foul territory on the first bounce or on the fly was an out. So if you caught it on the bounce, you were playing without gloves, that was an out. They changed that rule at the winter meetings in 66, 67, so a foul ball was still an out if caught on the first bounce. But a ball in play, in fair play, had to be caught on the fly. And they were writing sheet music in the 1860s saying the manly way to play the game is to catch the ball on the fly. So that's why that sheet music, catch it on the fly, was done. Uh, again, it was a barehanded game through the 1870s into the 1880s for most fielders. And there were still major leaguers playing without gloves into the early 1900s because that's how they had grown up and knowing that the manly way to play was without uh, anything on your hands. I'll have a reference here, I think, on the next slide, if we get there. Being stubborn. I know where my, uh, there we go. Uh, upcoming slide. So here is what I was talking about with the moral attributes of a model baseball player. And this comes out of an 1867 publication, but it predates, I've, I've seen it in the Brooklyn Eagle pre-1860, where the principal rule of action of our model baseball player is to comport himself like a gentleman on all occasions, but especially on match days, days of games. Uh, and in so doing, he abstains from profanity and his twin and vile brother obscenity, leaving these vices to be alone cultivated by the graduates of penitentiaries. <laughs> he never censures errors of play made by a brother member or an opponent, as he is well aware that fault finding not only leads to no improvement in the play of the one who blunders, but on the contrary is calculated to have the very reverse effect. He was never known to, just like today, he was never known to dispute the decision of an umpire. For knowing the peculiar position of an umpire is placed in, he is careful never to wound his feelings by implying that his judgment is weak. And, and this one will make sense to everybody. He never takes on generous advantage of his opponents, but acts toward them as he would wish them to act toward himself. That's the golden rule. I don't have to explain. And so it fits within the Judeo-Christian tradition saying, and, and the, in the rules, the rule committee had already passed no gambling on baseball. And talking about not using obscenities. You wanted it to be appropriate for women and children to attend, so to attend a match. And with no gambling, it would be different than horse racing uh, or boxing. So this was something that fit within Victorian culture. Uh, <clears throat> just one of the earliest references that I've seen to a Des Moines club in talking about the Capital City Club is by, they were clubs, as we said, they had bylaws and they had a constitution, so they always get called clubs in the early days, not teams. Uh, so the Capital City Club of Des Moines is going to be playing the Hawkeye Club of Mount Pleasant, and uh, they'll be playing in Mount Pleasant on the 22nd of, of August. And so uh, this was the sort of announcement that you would typically see in newspapers across the country uh, pre-1880, really. Uh, just saying there will be a match game uh, between these two clubs. And often there would be a home and away series, essentially what we think of a home and away, where if the Des Moines club went to Mount Pleasant, then the Mount Pleasant club would come up to Des Moines and play. And, uh, Archie Cook gave me a, a little couple of, of leads, and those of you who are Des Moines Historical Society members know Archie pretty well. Uh, he's a friend of mine uh, as well. And at least pre-1871, one of the uh, amateur baseball field areas in Des Moines was you know, today what we think of as the sculpture park, but that little farther west, I think it was between 15th and 17th, uh, just south of Locust. Uh, is what Archie has found for some of those 1870s era matches. So that was where 
You know, if you had a big green space, that usually worked. Uh, by the 1890s, I know they're playing just north of the Raccoon River, like around 7th Street is where the more formal ball grounds become. That was where the Polk County Fairgrounds were at the time, is, is what uh, research is, is shown. And just an example, so talking, I won't go into this in, in too much depth, but uh, state tournaments were being held by the 1860s. Uh, that year, 1867, really is the big year all across the northern United States when baseball is really taking off. I think there was that kind of year period of mourning after President Lincoln's assassination, but in 1867, things are really ready to go. And so uh, we have a state baseball tournament by 1867, uh, referencing in the uh, Cedar Rapids paper that baseball mania has, has taken place that year. Uh, referencing too that baseball has started to become standardized with those rules committees. So by that 1858 publication, it's 90 foot bases, uh, three outs, nine innings, uh, strikes, and balls vary through different years. Uh, and there wasn't a pitcher's mound, it was a pitcher's box. It was uh, nine feet, I believe, by uh, six feet for the pitcher's box through most of the 1860s and a striker's line. Uh, and so when you see a baseball field layout from the 1860s, they'll often show uh, an umpire being off to the side on the left-hand batter's side, because most hitters being right-handed, the umpire's standing, and if that gentleman were the batter, you want to see where the ball is coming across uh, you know, armpits to knees, depending on how the batter's asked for it. So the umpire would typically stand off into the uh, left-handed batter's side of the batter's box. Uh, so this is a fairly accurate representation of uh, positioning of, of players in the 1860s. This one comes out of Haney's uh, baseball. Did the, um, did the umpire move if there was a left-handed hitter? I, I have to believe so. Uh, and so I, I now, because I know baseball history pretty well, volunteer at Living History Farms as their umpire. So uh, if I'm umpiring, I'm shifting side to side. Uh, there's not as many left-handed hitters. so. You, is, yeah. I knew as a left-handed hitter, and you all know. Uh, you don't have to move too often, but every now and then. And just uh, uniforms were becoming typical. So the Cedar Rapids uh, Times of 1871 is showing baseball gear being available uh, at baseballs, bats, etc. Uh, a reference in the 1871 Monticello, uh, Iowa Express talking about uh, the the suits that the boys were wearing cost $75 and it was contributed by the public to purchase them a suit of baseball clothing and the young ladies of the city made up the goods. So presuming that was the fabric and that then the women of Monticello were sewing them. So by 1871, granted Monticello is a decent sized town, but the same would have been true in Des Moines, players are wearing uniforms. They are a club. They want to look like they're all together. So. Uh, it wasn't like we were a bunch of rubes in Iowa in the 1860s and 1870s. We were aspiring to do the same things that the Eastern clubs were doing. I know uh, from one of the references that the Fort Dodge Club sent a representative to the national meeting in 1867. So Iowans were participating in the national activities. <laughs> Just another example of some of the types of equipment. So. Uh, High top shoes, you'd screw a plate onto the front, kind of triangular plate with three cleats at each corner, and a triangular plate with uh, three cleats on the, the back heel. That was a typical cleat of the 1860s through the 1880s. Uh, but I love that if you, if you know baseball, uh, a pitcher often, if you're a right-hander, drags their back toe, and that will tear up. front toe of your uh, cleat. So they were even putting pitchers toe plates around by the 1880s. Uh, so this is a, a company out of Massachusetts that was selling that stuff. Spaulding gets his start as a player, but then he also uh, becomes a manager and starts selling equipment. So if you see this style of bat in a historic photo where there's a black label in the middle, even if you can't see it, you can almost guarantee Spaulding was really the national league supplier of materials. So all through the 
hundreds into the 1900s, the National League used a Spalding baseball because that was what National League used. And then Reach was the American League supplier through the 1920s. Uh, but you'll see mo a lot of clubs using Spalding gear. So is the Spalding related to the outfit in Cornell? Uh, no, good question. Not, not that I know of, not directly. Uh, Albert G. was out of Rockford, Illinois. Uh, and there may have been some relationship to the Grinnell Spaldings, but not that I'm aware of directly. I've never really looked, but I would have thought, I mean, again, the Spaldings of Grinnell uh, are athletically inclined as well. Before they do automobiles, they're doing bicycles. So uh, to answer your question most accurately, I don't know, but I don't think so, is my gut. I, I, I've paid enough attention that I thought I would have encountered that, but uh, and just another example of uh, how games were done and, and some of the rules, and, and I love this one uh, from the Waterloo Courier of 1874. Each team would have to agree upon the umpire, L.A. Cobb, and it references that uh, the toss of the penny was in favor of the mutuals who sent the visitors to bat. So through the 1870s, we think of a coin toss in football that actually goes back to baseball. Uh, the visiting club would issue a challenge to the host club, but to determine who was going to strike first, you did a coin toss, and you, we at Living History Farms, we let the visitors choose heads or tails, uh, but that was how you determined through the 1870s who was going to strike first. It wasn't home visitors like we think of today. It was a coin toss. Uh, I don't know how well you can see the score of this game. Uh, again, it's nine innings. I'm going to have to step back too. I think that game was like 59 to 34 because they're playing without gloves and you're trying to catch it on the fly. Very high scoring games through the 1870s. That is not an atypical score on that match. Uh, again, box scores go back to the 1850s. That's one of the things about baseball. Uh, we have the records of clubs, and so you'll see box scores showing up, even full game accounts in some newspapers. I've not seen one in, in a Des Moines paper of the 1870s yet, but it'll list batter by batter what they did. And so that's what this little excerpt here from the Waterloo Courier of 1874 again is. And usually you see matches being played from <coughs> the 4th of July time to late fall. Uh, part of that was connected, especially in rural communities, when you would laid your corn by and maybe harvested your oats or wheat and had it in shocks but not yet, or stacks, but not yet threshed it out. So that's the peak ball playing time uh, in most communities, including Des Moines, is from about 4th of July into October. Here's just an example talking about gloves. Uh, catchers were the first to wear gloves. We've seen if you're behind the plate, to not be unmanly to be wearing a set of gloves. There's two gloves, one on each hand, uh, and usually fingerless so that if you were gripping the ball, you had a good grip. And when I was researching that Detroit tournament in 67, I came across in the free press where it references that players are starting to wear buckskin on their hands, and the writer is critical of them, saying it's causing them to throw poorly, and that they probably would have played better if they weren't wearing those gloves. So. We know gloves at least are being introduced by the 1860s, but because of social pressure on its unmanly, and perhaps because they're a little awkward, they don't really take off, except for catchers, uh, until the 1880s. So talking about the history of Des Moines clubs, uh, this comes from the Annals of Iowa, uh, 1941, an article uh, listing the Des Moines clubs of 1867. So you have the Capital City Club, the Rough and Ready Club, the Mechanics, so those were probably men who did uh, foundry work or maybe blacksmithing, uh, car perhaps carpentry or woodworking, they were sometimes known as mechanics. Uh, the Pioneers, so perhaps some early settlers. Uh, the Star City Club, the Tough and Gritty Club, the Young America Club, the Young Eagles Club, and the Shirt Tail Rangers. And the reference from the Iowa State uh, Register that mentioned the Shirt Tail Rangers said they were composed of jolly little urchins who have just left their mamas. Uh, <laughs> so that's at least the, the 
comprehensive 1867, as I said, baseball was really taking off in 1867 across the country. And Des Moines was no different. Uh, and just a, then a quick history, of, those are amateur clubs in theory. They don't get paid. Then you start to get professional teams by 1887 in Des Moines. So you've got the Des Moines Hawkeyes, then the Prohibitionists fitting with our state, uh, always uh, flirting with should we have statewide prohibition even before the federal laws. The Des Moines Hawkeyes, the Des Moines Midgets, the Des Moines Undertakers, the Prohibitionists come back, the Underwriters, uh, the what had been the Underwriters win the <clears throat> Uh, Western League Championship, and so they get known as the Des Moines Champions two years running. Then they become the Des Moines Boosters uh, for that period. Des Moines Demons. Demons go away uh, in 37. The Bruins come in in 47, so after World War II, the Bruins come in. Uh, then for a short time, the Demon name comes back. Uh, then it goes back to Bruins, and then it goes back to Demons and, until the Oaks come in. That's the last professional team in Des Moines, uh, is the, the Demons of 61. Yeah? What level did the Bruins play at? <clears throat> uh, Bruins, I think, were single A, if I remember right. Yeah. <coughs> or what we would call single A here. But the Prohibitionists were a well enough known club that in 1888 and 1889, they were making the cigarette and cigar uh, card photos of the Des Moines players. So you've got. Emmerke, a uh, picture of Des Moines, that's an 1889 card, I believe. Uh, Mastery, the right fielder of Des Moines, uh, that's an 88 card. And then uh, Brynan, uh, who's a pitcher of Des Moines, and that's an 88 card. So uh, Des Moines, yeah, thanks, Karen. Uh, I'm used to talking loud and fairly long from my time of living history farms in the 80s. Uh, you know, you talk to a couple thousand people a day out there back then. Uh, so, the Des Moines clubs were nationally known even in the 1880s in the professional circles. There we go. Uh, <clears throat> and that Des Moines Champions Club that I referenced, uh, this is the 1906 version of that club. They had some good young players, uh, including number 10 who is right over here. Uh, actually, I wanted to remember. Where did he go? Oh, yeah, this is number 10 that I want. Uh, just I had a bad angle. Uh, his last name is Sycott. Anybody recognize that name in the group? Yeah. He plays with the Black Sox. Yeah, he's one of the pitchers that throws the 1919 World Series. Uh, but he was a good young pitcher for the Des Moines Club in 1906. So Ed Sycott uh, was a, a Des Moines champion. Their record was 97 and 50 that year, and uh, they were they were a, a Western League champs. Do you mean they played almost 150 games? Yeah, yeah. Today it's a 162 game season, so. Uh, by now they are. They're playing from May into uh, October, well September. Uh, so yeah, they were they were getting in enough for 150, 147 games. Were there not a doubleheader? You know, I honestly don't know. That's a good question, and I thought of that as we were talking about that. It wouldn't surprise me if there were a couple of you know uh, doubleheaders being done, but I don't think they were. All that common. Could these guys make a living doing this? Uh, not really. I mean, it, as as a lot of you who are baseball fans know, a lot of the <coughs> ball players, even through the 50s and 60s, yeah. uh, until free agency really comes in, you're working a winter job if you're a yeah. major but league or during, triple A during player. During the season, if they had enough games, there were probably not too many other things you could do. Right. Exactly. Yeah. They weren't working during the the season. Mm -hmm. It was during the off season when you'd be doing a regular job. So this is a story that maybe a few of you know, uh, but is one of my favorite Des Moines stories that I've learned uh, since moving back. And there was a team founded in 1912 by J.L. Wilkinson. Leslie was his middle name, that's how most people knew him. It was, I think, John Leslie Wilkinson. He was a native of Algona, but he had come to Des Moines to play baseball in the early 1900s. 
uh, he becomes uh, manager and forms a team called the All Nations team that had uh, a man of Japanese ancestry who was, had played for the University of Chicago. So they've got a Japanese player. Uh, they've got a couple of African American players on the club. Uh, they've got uh, at least a couple men that are being represented as Latino or, or Cuban. One player who's being represented as Hawaiian uh, on the club, and we'll talk about him in a second. Uh, and so Wilkinson will get uh, you know a car on a Pullman a Pullman car on a train, barnstorm across the state and into uh, Missouri. Uh, Nebraska may have been in the Dakotas, I also don't know. But this was a team that was Des Moines based, uh, 1912 to 1907, uh, 1915, I think they moved on to Kansas City right before the war. They're in Kansas City, 1916, 17, 18, and then when World War I, the Great War, they don't know it's World War I then, uh, when the Great War is going on, they cease operation. So Wilkinson has taken this team around the state. Uh, here's an example of a game account from a North Iowa newspaper. They're up around Sibley in Osceola County, so uh, quite a ways northwest. It says, on August 7th, and I think this is a 1914 uh, game, if I remember right. I didn't put the date on the paper. And they're playing against Laverne, and it says, 1,200 fans saw the All Nations Club defeat the strong Laverne team today in an exciting pitcher's battle by the score of 2-1. to one. Maloney and Donaldson and Donaldson uh, was a well-known uh, African-American pitcher. Donaldson, the clever southpaw, were the opposing pitchers, and Donaldson plays for the All Nations Club. Uh, Donaldson was credited with 16 strikeouts, so nine inning game, 16 strikeouts, uh, and allowed but three hits, won a scratch. The game was won in the ninth inning when Blackner, the Hawaiian, <laughs> doubled to right and scored on a single by Brindley, who pinched for the chaff, not a term we would use today, uh, Father McCauley of Sibley consented to act as umpire, and his work was a treat to all true baseball fans. <laughs> and so there's your score. But again, these box scores and line scores are, are, are pretty typical. And this is, you know, 1914. Lists who the pitcher and catcher are. Donaldson is the pitcher for the All Nations Club, and Shanberg is the catcher, uh, probably representing the Germans. Uh, and then Laverne had Maloney and Matthews. So here you had an integrated team traveling the state of Iowa uh, from Des Moines uh, and, and being at least, uh, I don't know, uh, appreciated across, across the state. And, and so I'd like to talk about Frank Blattner because the State Historical Museum has a World War I document listing African-American uh, servicemen. And there was a guy named Frank Blattner uh, on that list. And so we looked up his card. Oh, sorry about that. And here it is, Frank Blattner of Oskaloosa. So unless Oskaloosa has moved to the Hawaiian Islands, uh, born in 1890, but he, it, I had a volunteer doing this work, and she said, hey, I found this guy who says he's a baseball player. And you look and you see who his boss is, and it's J.L. Wilkinson of Des Moines. Uh, though now of Kansas City because it's 1918. And he's got a wife, he's married. If you're ever looking at World War I uh, enlistment cards, if the corners <coughs> clipped, that means they're African American. Uh, that was how the federal government kept track of which men were African American and which weren't. Uh, and so this is a copy of Frank Blattner, not Hawaiian, but an African American man from uh, Oskaloosa who played for the All Nations Club. Uh, this is his enlistment card. He's tall, uh, and uh, his body form is stout, and uh, he's got brown eyes, brown hair, no physical. Uh, he's not bald, that's what that one is. Uh, so it, when uh, Lois, the volunteer, said, hey, this guy says he's a baseball player, I was like, oh, let me see that reference. And it's like, oh, then we started doing the work on Frank Blattner and found out, yeah, Wilkinson's marketing him as a Hawaiian. Uh, <laughs> So Wilkinson was not above, you know, a little bit of uh, lying in marketing his team. And uh, Blattner, not a real good image here, uh, I think is, is this fellow right back there. That's either Blattner or Donaldson. 
Uh, but you see, they were actually sponsored by the Hopkins Brothers Sporting Goods Company. Again, if you grew up in central Iowa, even through the early 2000s, you knew Hopkins was out there on University and Clyde. Well, they used to be downtown. That was where I shopped when I was a boy, was at the Hopkins downtown. And then there's Wilkinson living in uh, on Clark Street, 1338 Clark, uh, from the Polk County Directory. Des Moines Directory, I think this is the 1914 one that I pulled, or 15, to find where he was living. Uh, but again, Haywarden is a northwest Iowa town, and they're talking about the All-Nation Club coming up to their community. So that Des Moines All-Nations Club was really well known. And uh, if you've seen Ken Burns' baseball series, uh, you know the player Buck O'Neill who played for the Kansas City Monarchs. Buck O'Neill uh, said that J.L. Wilkinson was the most unprejudiced uh, Euro-American man he'd ever met, and because of that, uh, Wilkinson actually goes on to become the founding owner of the Kansas City Monarchs. And so he's the last Iowan to be voted into the Baseball Hall of Fame. 2006, uh, J.L. Wilkinson, because of his uh, work with the Kansas City Monarchs, is elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame. So that's a Des Moines story that not a lot of us know, I don't think, and one that is, is kind of interesting, but also uh, a compelling story of a guy who was willing to put together a bunch of different men. Yeah? Maybe getting ahead of the story here, but does Blattner have any connection with Buxton? Uh, I, he never mined there, but you're right, there's a lot of, so Buxton, if you don't know Buxton, Iowa history, and you people are all interested in Iowa history, but it was a mixed race mining community at times, uh, as much as 60% uh, African American, the consolidation uh, coal company founded it right around 1899, if I remember right, and brought in men from all different backgrounds. And so Oskaloosa being in Mahaska County, not far from Buxton, because Mahaska's on the Monroe-Mahaska uh, County line, uh, had a strong connection. But I think the Blattners were in Oskaloosa before, so they were probably one of those post-Civil War migration uh, families that, that came into Oskaloosa. The Oskaloosa with William Penn was a sorry, getting a little off track, but was a Quaker community to a degree, so had a higher level of tolerance for some African Americans, so uh, wouldn't be surprising to have, it wasn't surprising to have a decent number of African Americans uh, settling in Oskaloosa after the war. Uh, so the demons are known for many things. They were the resurgence of baseball, but what they're best known for, other teams had played under portable lights, but in 1930, uh, May 2nd, uh, May 1st was actually the game, but May 2nd, uh, permanent lights were put at Pioneer Park, uh, which was where current Sec Taylor Field uh, Principal Park is today. I think, I want to say, uh, it's 1930, I'm trying to remember when that location becomes the prominent location, I'm, I'm not remembering. Uh, but. The Des Moines Demons uh, play the first game under fixed lights. So that's another, that's, if you're Des Moines history people, most of you know that story. But just wanted it on the record for uh, the date. So that's another piece of uh, uh, Des Moines baseball history. And then the Bruins are the next club uh, professionally to come in. Uh, just an example, here's the 1948 club. I'm trying to remember if there's anybody of, of consequence from uh, Terwilliger played in the majors. Uh, I don't recognize any other names off that club who made it to the major leagues, but Terwilliger. Well, their manager, Sam. Oh, yeah, 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 thank you. Yeah. Swatsky played in the majors. Okay. Just another example of uh, the Demons. So, 57. Uh, the Demons are back after the, the Bruins have uh, gone away. Love that KRT is carrying the, the games. And then in 1969, as Major League Baseball has expanded, the Oakland Athletics need a AAA team. And so Des Moines becomes the home of the AAA Oakland affiliate. Besides the Oak being our state tree, uh, being affiliated with the Oakland Athletics, uh, that made sense. I don't know that I was at opening day. I know my brother was, because uh, we got the ticket stub from opening day, uh, 69. 
And then I was, you know, a little baseball urchin. Uh, so that scorecard on the right is one of my scorecards from 1977 where I'd stand outside the clubhouse door and just say, hey, can I have your autograph? Hey, can I have your autograph? Hey, can I? I did that like, the guys finally started knowing me because I would do it all the time. Uh, so I have about eight scorecards from that year uh, right around the same time. Uh, and then, just as a general overview of AAA and Des Moines, so from 69 to 72, we're affiliated with the Oakland A's. 73 and 74, Chicago White Sox. Tony La Russa actually started with the Oakland A's, and so it was an Oakland athletic when he was uh, first in Des Moines. But then he did get traded over or signed with Chicago, so he plays uh, here as a White Sox and then uh, knows, knows Des Moines through that relationship. The one that always threw me as a kid, it was like, why are we a Houston Astro affiliate? Uh, so that was the 1975 uh, season, one year only, we were with the Houston Astros. And then from 76 to 80, we're back to the White Sox. And then 81, the relationship with the Chicago Cubs begins. Uh, we're still the Oaks in 81. In 1982, the name does change what, to the Iowa Cubs. Wasn't the manager the second time? I, I, I believe so. Because I think yeah. he got moved up to the White Sox yeah. from here. Yeah. Uh, and so we become the Iowa Cubs in 1982. That's the uh, iteration we are in now of professional baseball in Des Moines. Uh, as I said, I'm by no means comprehensive, but that's a brief look at the history of baseball in Des Moines. Thank you for your time. I'll take comments, questions, anything you want. Yes, Pat. You might want to look again at my game because it was at the Western League Park across from North High. And I do. I think you're right on that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, as I was thinking, 47 is when, I was thinking in my head, 47 is when they moved to what is today principal park location. So it wasn't, wasn't it was post 30. So yeah. you'll get no argument from me on they that. They had nice signs documenting it down there. Yeah, the yeah, 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 I would agree wholeheartedly. So strike strike that from the tape. Edit that out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, were the Bruins or the Demons ever affiliated? Not formally that I'm aware of, though there might have been some short relationship with the Phillies yeah, in some the Phillies, time. Especially yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think in their late late iteration, it was the Phillies. Yeah. So there, we've got confirmation on that. It was the Phillies. Yeah. See when I was a kid. Here's a picture of the old ballpark between fourth and sixth on Grand. Oh, there we go. Yeah. In 1906. Is that in one of John's books? Which, which no, this is a uh, police behind the. Yeah, band. John Zeller. John Zeller's book. Oh, okay. I forgot the author. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Okay. Yeah, I, I recognized it. Uh, it's where the Y is now. Yeah, yeah. Better. Very good. So before I came, I looked up night baseball. Uh huh. Wikipedia entry says that the night, first night of baseball game happened in Independence, Kansas, in and, April. And with fixed lights would be the issue. Were they fixed lights or were they portable? Well, there was there was talk of fixed lights, but I don't remember. Who was yeah. That's that's my understanding. How Des Moines is still, as we all know, don't believe everything on the internet. <laughs> uh, so my understanding is that Major League Baseball recognizes that Des Moines game of May 30. As this particular article took pains to say that Des Moines is not. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if somebody from Independence wrote that. Yeah. yeah. It looked like. It yeah. Look like. Probably just edited this afternoon. <laughs> yes. Maybe so. Yes. Uh, our committee researched that quite a bit. I was principal at North High School when we put up the stadium there. And one of the reasons that it was so important is because that is the history, the, the baseball history of the Western League field. And that was a big controversy, but the important thing is permanent lighting. Yeah. It was it was the first nighttime game on May 2nd, 1930, funded by Leo Kaiser, and that was for permanent lighting. There was uh, a game played earlier, and that was done to kind of beat Des Moines. They yeah. hastily put that together, but it was not permanent. It was yeah, just they weren't the permanent lighting. fixed lights. Yeah. That's right. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. I remember the 
uh, exhibition game in 1975 against the Houston Astros. Uh huh. And uh, the Astros were, I don't know, a bad year that year, but uh, they beat the Iowa Oaks pretty soundly. And uh, Joe Negro was pitching for the uh, oh, yep. uh, Iowa Oaks then. Oh, uh, Negro was with the Oaks, not the Astros then? Yeah. As a young guy. Uh, or semi young, because Phil was yeah. the owner of the two. Yeah. Yeah. Because Phil was up by 75, I know, with the Braves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that would make sense that Joe, is a little bit younger, might have been on the Astros. I don't remember that Astros team, whereas I remember the 77 team. And I remember a lot of those Oakland A's because those, as I said, Renee Latchman was a friend of our family. And. Uh, so we, we do those guys. That my brother delivered papers, the register, uh, in Clive between uh, Franklin up to Summit, and some of those houses are maybe Sunny Hill uh, down there, and then the then the, the apartments. And so uh, that was how those players got to know our family. Was my brother was their paper boy. Yeah. Do you have some place to roster some of those different teams? Uh, we do not at the State Historical Museum, and that's not one that I've taken the pains to, to research yet. Because I know that that, uh, Oak, that Oaks team, in the, when they were with the athletics, a number of those players that went through and came were part of those great Oakland teams in the 70s. Yeah, I, I, I think... Uh, the number of them went through here. I yeah, Joe Rudy did. Vita Blue, I think, was one. Yeah, and yeah Vita Blue out. still has the record for the most strikeouts by an Iowa yeah. player, and 16 in a game. Yeah. And I think there were some of the others that were on those great Oakland teams that were what they went Yeah, Joe Rudy came those. through, Gene Tess Joe came Rudy, through. Yeah, there were a number of them that came yeah. through here. Yeah. George Hendrick. Yeah, George Hendrick. Well, you got a broken George Hendrick bat yeah. in our family collection. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that, George didn't get his best years with the A's, but he, did. he was a young player with that. That would be interesting if sometime we could find those. Oh, there. So yeah, well, the box scores, actually, if you yeah, want to take the time. Can, yeah, maybe yeah. Can. And, and I know those early, if you get the yearbook, the yearbook will have the players in them, too. Yeah? Babe uh, Ruth and Luke Harris played for Mighty Air Park, too. That, that's right. And in fact, Babe Ruth put on a Drake football uniform and ran some players with the football players. And, and that, that piece I didn't know, but John Leafa, I think, has either, and if you don't know John Leafa, he used to be at DMAC. He's an Iowa baseball historian. The premier Iowa baseball historian. And Can you imagine today uh, a guy like making a hundred thousand dollars a year going out and playing with running a few plays with the football? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but John, I think John either has a ticket from that game, where the exhibition game where Garrig and, and Ruth played. Uh, so John's done some decent work on that. Satchel that Page also played. That's right. Yep. Uh, this game with uh, uh, Ruth and Garrig was it just like an exhibition game with the Yankees, or was it were they? Was Major League would barnstorm all star teams mm -hmm. after the season. So the guys that were really good, that's how they made their money. No, I knew Babe Ruth did some of those. Like Babe Ruth All Stars or whatever. Yeah. I, I knew he did that. I didn't know if that was why he was here in Boyd or if he did it was the Yankees organization. Yeah, no, it was not the Yankees. It was postseason generally or uh, preseason when they did those as, as barnstorming games. Yeah. Okay. There was also a young lady that struck multiple miles. I'll believe you. There was a postcard of the first two morning night game uh, on the internet. My son gave up at 30 bucks, but he was really interested. Yeah. Somebody those those real out. photo postcards mm -hmm. of that game are out there. <coughs> Well, thank you, Linda, for inviting me, and to all of you for showing up tonight. Really appreciate it. And thanks for doing your own introductions. Yeah. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's quite all right. <laughs>